Welcome to the Exploring Unschooling podcast. I'm Pam Larickia, longtime unschooling mom and author. Join me and my wonderful guests for interviews, information, and inspiration about unschooling and living joyfully with your family. You can find the episode show notes, your free introductory ebook, What is Unschooling?, and lots more information at livingjoyfully.ca. And here's the show. Hello, everyone. I'm Pam Larickia, and this is episode number 84 of the podcast. It's the 9th of August, 2017, as I record this intro. My guest this week is Scott Noel. Scott is an unschooling dad of two, an author, and a life coach dedicated to supporting parents who want to move away from control-based parenting methods. It was so much fun to have the opportunity to chat with him. Uh, We dive into his wonderful PATH parenting framework, the value of nonverbal communication, uh, ways we can hold presence with negative feelings, how fear can sometimes slip into control, and as a founding member, he shares some great information about the history and goals of the Alliance for Self-Directed Education. And as a personal update this week, I'm still working away on the Unschooling Journey book. It'll be interesting to see if next week I get to say I sent it to my editor. (laughs) I hope so. (laughs) And I want to say thank you to everyone who has chosen to support the show on Patreon. And a big welcome to new patrons Tracy Emby and Michelle Leah Gomez. I deeply appreciate all my patrons. You guys inspire me. And I love that you're helping me share unschooling information with anyone who wants to explore ways to live this wonderful lifestyle with their family. And if you'd like to support the show, even for as little as a dollar a month, check out the Exploring Unschooling page at patreon.com. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash exploring unschooling. And this week's quote is from Scott. A lot of power gets drained from us when we're in the state of anxiety. And if we can find a way to move into trust, then it does really transform our experience. And our kids tend to respond in a positive way that leads to easier times, all in all. I wanted to pull that out because it is just so spot on. Anxiety and fear drain us of the ability to see choices and the power to take that next step. Choosing trust isn't easy, but it is truly transformative. The challenge is it's one of those you need to experience it to believe it kind of deals. Because it's not about ignoring fears. It's more about embracing them and choosing to move forward. Maybe it's a bit like this quote from Franklin D. Roosevelt. Courage is not the absence of fear, but rather the assessment that something else is more important than fear. Scott also talks about how trust develops through our growing understanding, which aligns so nicely with how I talk about developing trust in my book, Free to Live. Still, there's that initial leap to trust we need to make so that we can have that first transformative experience and begin to understand how that happens, even when we have no idea exactly what will happen. And then maybe that next leap will seem a little bit smaller, and then the next one smaller still. It gets easier. And now, on to the interview with Scott. Hi, everyone. I'm Pam Larickia from livingjoyfully.ca, and today I'm here with Scott Noel. Hi, Scott. Hey, Pam. It's really good to talk to you finally. Yeah, it's wonderful to have you on. I'm very excited. Uh, For people who may not know, Scott is an unschooling dad of two teenagers, an author, and a life coach dedicated to supporting parents who want to move away from control-based parenting methods. Uh, He's also the founder of the website dailygroove.com, where he shares his practical parenting insights. I am really excited to dive into his unschooling and parenting experience. So to get us started, Scott, can you share with us a bit about you and your family? Sure. And I, I need to update my bio here because uh, a couple months ago, my uh, my eldest uh, turned 20, so I can no longer <laughs> say I have two teenagers. I, I was wondering when the last time you updated that was. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, yeah. Uh, so I live in Portland, Oregon, and um, that is a good place to be weird. I don't know, <laughs> we sort of have a reputation for having lots of weirdos here and 
we like it that way because uh, we don't get uh, too many raised eyebrows about being alternative and unconventional because it's sort of conventional to be unconventional here. And um, so, you know, we can nurse in public. Well, I can't, but my <laughs> wife could when the kids were nursing and and uh, and that was never a problem. Um, and unschooling, the same sort of thing. It seems like everyone's doing something alternative here. Anyway, um, so my partner, her name is Beth, and we've been married now 25 years. Um, and our kids have always been unschooling. Um, my youngest is 16. Her name is Willow. And my eldest is 20. Her name is Olivia. That is, I guess that's all. I, I could guess. go on and on and on. And <laughs> Um, well, we will probably, we'll get you to go on and on, um, explaining <laughs> a bit about your family's move to unschooling. So you said they've always been unschooling. Where, where did you first kind of hear about it and how did you and Beth decide that's the way you wanted to go? Well, we sort of entered parenthood completely unprepared and, um, and so we, we very much made it up as we went along. Um, I, I would have to say that my um, the, the, the spark of unschooling for me began when I was 19 years old and I dropped out of college and I was very disillusioned with the whole education system. And I said to myself, damn it, I can educate myself. Wow. <laughs> you know, Cause, uh, if there was one thing I knew, I knew that I was, I was a very curious person and I always had, you know, followed my, uh, passions to learn about things. So uh, so I, I didn't, I don't know if the word unschooling was even coined back then. Uh, if it was, I hadn't heard of it and, um, I didn't hear about it until much later. Uh, I would say, well, after our first child was born, we, we sort of, we were trying to do things as naturally as we could. That was the sort of the guiding principles is do things the natural way. So we had a home birth and, uh, we learned about, co-sleeping. We thought that sounds natural. <laughs> why, why should we isol isolate our baby and, you know, make her cry for us when we can just stay close. And, um, that led us to finding out about a book called the continuum concept, which a lot of unschoolers know about, mm -hmm. um, which sort of, um, looks at ancient cultures, indigenous people, hunter gatherers, and that sort of thing to try to get clues about what is our uh, basic human nature. And, um, so that led us to sort of what later became known as attachment parenting. And, um, about for a while, we just call it continuum parenting. And we were really, um, we became active. I actually reached out to the author of that book and this was back in 1997. And I said, um, I asked her if we could put it all online, not the book, but I mean, um, create a community online around the book because we really needed to um, share questions. This is back when like there was no Facebook, there was no uh, web 2.0, <laughs> no, web no. 1.0. And, <laughs> and so um, these are old forums, what we did right? Was, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was an email based uh, on a platform called listserv. So uh -huh. we started a listserv and that grew very large and a lot of people who had read that book and were inspired by it um, wanted to talk with each other about how to apply these sort of primitive principles in a modern setting. And, of course, one of the subjects that came up was education. Um, and a lot of people talked about John Holt because John Holt had been a fan of that book. And so we uh, got John Holt's first book, How Children Fail, which was sort of uh, a monumental, uh, moment in the, in the, uh, unschooling movement, I would say for a lot of people, that's the sort of book that convinces them to jump ship from conventional education and, and go for self-directed education. So that's how it started. Our daughter was about, uh, nearly two by then. And then we said, Hey, this, this makes so much sense. <laughs> you know, let's just, <laughs> let's do it this way. And so we really started unschooling consciously uh, when our first daughter was about two. And we, we just never turned back. Wow, that's really cool. I, 
I. It seems yeah. like yeah, I'm here. I just I was just, <laughs> um, you know, it just it's such a cool journey to. Um, were you guys in Portland at the time too? Like, how did you come across the Continuum Concept book? Um, well, that's a funny story because it, when our when our daughter was two months old, we were trying to do everything naturally, and we were co-sleeping and breastfeeding and all that, and then. Uh, but the one thing that didn't come to us intuitively was this idea that babies expect biologically, they expect to be held all the time, at least for the first few months. That's considered sort of the outer womb uh, or the, you know, the, the mm -hmm. outer gestational period um, or what Jean Liedloff calls the, the in arms period. And we didn't know about that. And so every time we set our baby down, she would start to cry and we mm -hmm. thought there was something wrong with her. Aren't you supposed to be able to set babies down? Yeah. And, um, um, but she was just very intolerant of that condition. And so we went to our doctor and fortunately we had a, a very, like a naturopathic type of a doctor, a woman doctor. She said, there's nothing wrong with your baby. You just need to read the continuum concept. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so we got the book that day and, um, it read it in about a day and it was just like mind blowing. It opened up everything. Suddenly everything made sense. And, um, and we had a sort of a compass now that we could use to make decisions about, um, how to navigate a modern world, given that we are genetically, uh, not much different than our ancient ancestors and that we've evolved for a much different uh, way of uh, living and learning and growing. So that's how it all started. Yeah, that's really cool. I'm just sitting here kind of quietly imagining if I'd have come across any of these ideas, you know, when I my children were first born, when my eldest was first born, you know, because it was many years and all three of my kids were in school by the time I finally saw that first thread. Because once you get that first thread right, then it's like, oh, this and then this. Like once you'd heard of that mm -hmm. book, look where your path kind of went from there, right? Yeah, um, it's it's uh, it, it all sort of falls into place. Mm -hmm. and, but but it, there is a kind of like people talk about de-schooling being something for kids. But it's, of course, you know, this it's as much for adults as it, if not more. Um, and fortunately, that part of it wasn't too hard for me and Beth because we had um, both had kind of negative experiences with the school system. Mm -hmm. um, and and but on opposite ends of the spectrum, she had really struggled to get just to get um, normal grades. And I had gotten really good grades, but I still felt like it was sort of meaningless and didn't didn't resonate with my heart's desires. So. Um, so we realized there's sort of no way to win. Mm -hmm, <laughs> it's yeah. just you just have to not play the game. Yeah. And to know that's an option. That's uh, that's awesome. Um, I also like you mentioned, you know, um, I guess your parenting wise, um, you mentioned this was like before attachment parenting because but, you know, that that attachment parenting thing, it's kind of um, come to the forefront or is uh, better known in the last maybe decade or so. But as you mentioned, this is all. Um, even back to the continuum, co continuum concept, this is all, um, you know, the way parenting has been for so long, right? Yeah. And, and one of the things that sort of led to my current career is that, um, it, it, as a parenting coach is that I noticed that, um, a lot of people, um, were sort of applying attachment parenting and continuum ideas on the surface and not really going very deep with it. Mm -hmm. So for example, they would say, Hey, I've been breastfeeding on demand and I've been carrying my baby 24 seven. Um, and we don't use punishments and, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And we co-sleep. And so why isn't my child happy? Why don't we have a perfect relationship? You know? Mm -hmm. And then they would describe what was not working. And, and it was clear to me that they hadn't, um, looked for the underlying uh, consciousness that um, is a part of and, and a different value system 
that was a part of our ancestry. That most importantly, it's this uh, what I call a partnership culture. It's this idea that we're all connected, and um, and we live in a society and a culture that really undermines that truth and makes us feel disconnected and separate and in competition with each other. And so we develop strategies of relationship that lead to, to lots of various kinds of power struggles and um, uh, just not enjoyable relationships, especially mm-hmm. between parents and children. That is such a cool point because when you think about it, it – um, from an unschooling perspective too, right? When people, uh, people come, um, and they kind of think, well, I kind of, I know the, the quote rules of unschooling, right? Uh, no mm-hmm. curriculum. Um, they, I say yes more, you know, and they do those things and life becomes a, a little chaotic and they're like, why isn't this working as peacefully as, as, you know, experienced unschoolers are explaining. And it's again, because you have to get into the foundation, into the relationships and the roots of it, right. For it to, to play out that way. You can't just kind of do on the surface what the actions are. You have to have that deep understanding of it. Right. You reminded me of a headline I saw the other day about uh, a baby orca whale that died because it was born in captivity and I'm sure they did all kinds of things to try to help it survive, but but um, we're not we're not designed by nature to survive in captivity, you know, or to mm-hmm. to thrive. Certainly not to thrive, but but in a way, uh, the conventional ways of thinking about education uh, create a kind of a prison uh, that really limits us uh, and and just uh, makes it hard to live according to our nature. And that's yeah. what I love about unschooling is that it's it's working with children's nature instead of against it. But in order to do that, we have to uh, learn a little bit about it and unlearn a lot of what we've been uh, trained to believe about about human nature and and habits of thought that have come from those beliefs. Yeah, that and that's that perfectly lines up with your point that, you know, so much of the de-schooling really is for the parents, right? Because we're the ones mm-hmm. that have been immersed in that culture for, for so much longer than our kids have. And that, yeah, that I'm leaves, still working on it. I know, me too. <laughs> There's always something, <laughs> After 20 right? Years. Yeah. Uh, that leads nicely to our next question because I want to dive into parenting with you. Uh, mm-hmm. You have you have a wonderful website, dailygroove.com, where people can sign up to receive daily emails from you. As I know I signed up early on in my unschooling journey. Now, we started back in 2002, and I, I really appreciated your nuggets of parenting insight. You know, uh, they would show up each morning, and I'd be, like, diving in just like, so I had something, like, in the back of my mind that I could ponder for the day. Um, you call it path parenting, and I love that not only is that an acronym, it's also a reminder that the journey, or the path, is the destination. So I was hoping you could share an overview of what path parenting is. Sure, yeah, and it actually, it began, as I was saying before, with this realization that that a lot of the parents that I was interacting with didn't seem to to get the deeper aspect of the consciousness of parenting rather than just the behavior of it. Mm-hmm. And, and so I thought, well, you can't just tell someone to change their consciousness. You can say, do something different, but, but to actually think and perceive the world in a different way really takes practice because you have been practicing your whole life, seeing things a certain way, interpreting things a certain way. And, and so that's what gave me the idea to do the daily groove which would be the, this idea that you, the way you create a groove is one, you know, one pass at a time. Mm-hmm. And if you keep, uh, if you just bit by bit, you know, do a little bit every day to practice thinking a little differently or seeing things a little differently, then um, pretty soon that becomes, I guess you would say second nature, but I would consider it more first nature. Um, <laughs> so, so I, I, uh, I started that and, and I and I thought, okay, well, it has to be it has to be really brief, and uh, because everyone's too busy, right, <laughs> to read yeah. a long essay every day. <laughs> so it's just a brief reminder, and uh, and I, I and 
my challenge, my creative challenge, which I really enjoyed, was how can I take big ideas and condense them down to under 200 or 150, 150 words? And um, I guess I, I must have been pretty good at that because uh, a whole bunch of people started uh, sharing it and signing up for it. And that's how I knew I had hit on something that was valuable. Mm -hmm. So, But that was all before I came up with this idea of this path framework. I actually had written several hundred of them when I said, okay, let's see if we can condense this even more into some set of uh, principles that have practical value. And actually, um, I, I, I went and analyzed all the daily groups I had written and tried to sort of distill them to certain concepts and principles and then group them into things. And finally, I came up with this particular grouping and tweaked it a little bit so it would make a nice acronym. <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, but I think the num so PATH is, uh, is an acronym that stands for uh, what I consider the uh, four positive pathways to power. And I focus on power because I found that the, the problems that people have the most are, are problems of, you know, power struggles and are feeling disempowered. Um, and, uh, and that people, when they try to uh, reach for their power, th uh, they tend to fall back on the habits of our society, which are generally um, not healthy ways of being powerful. Um, so I tend to call that pseudo power. But um, authentic power really comes from uh, these four pathways. So uh, the first pathway to power is partnership. And uh, partnership is a pathway to power through connection. So um, when we feel connected to each other, um, then it changes the way we relate in terms of our power. Instead of competing for power, we actually reinforce each other's power. And that when I feel powerful, it makes my child feel more powerful. And when my child feels more powerful, I feel more powerful. The only way that doesn't work is if we pit our power against each other. So as long as you maintain this mindset of connection, you have um, this um, really powerful pathway. Um, so that's partnership. And then the A stands for authenticity. And um, authenticity is a pathway to power through alignment. And what that means is that um, most people have their, uh, their power or their energies sort of misaligned, like a part of me is going this way and a part of me is going that way. And, um, or part of me wants this, and a part of me doesn't want that, another part of me is afraid or whatever. So there's all these ways in which we're out of alignment. Um, but if you tune into what is uh, your most authentic self, uh, your innermost being or who you really are, and you sort of um, try do your best to shed all the um, aspects that you've picked up over the years that aren't really truly you. Things often they're the things that ways that you think you should be, um, or that people have told you you know that you need to be. And when you can let those things go and connect with who you really are, um, then you get this alignment and. Um, and, and all those energies that were scattered um, are suddenly in the same direction. And that creates an extraordinary kind of power that's kind of, um, it's hard to describe it. It's, a, it's an abstract thing that uh, people can feel. Um, and you know, for example, when, when you meet someone who's really what they say and, and what they do, it seems to be a really clear reflex, reflection of who they are. And... And something about that just feels really powerful. Um, and it makes you want to align with them too. And as a child, um, when the parent is has that kind of authenticity and alignment, it makes the child um, more willing to be in alignment with the parent. Mm -hmm. And it works the other way too, of course, so that um, parents need to learn to recognize the authenticity of their children and honor that and find ways to align with that. So I, does that yeah, make sense? I, 
He really does. Because just imagine that, right? You you can feel like the weight and the pull of, geez, I should do this. Maybe I should do that. And and you feel like you don't get anywhere, right? Because your power is pulling in all different directions rather than when you're in alignment. I mean, that image is really powerful. Like you can, you can just feel so much more energy to accomplish things and move forward. And the, and thinking of it in the other way with your kids, that's something that I found so much, um, especially those first few years, just because it was so different for me. When my kids were, were younger, those first few years, it was so different with them because, um, when they they would naturally align themselves, right? They're naturally in the moment, knowing what they want to do and pursuing it. And I learned so much about how powerful and capable children are just by watching them. And and I learned so much more about how to do that myself by watching them, right? It's it's amazing to see what that authenticity and, and uh, alignment what kind of an effect it can have, uh, in your life. Mm, Yeah. I, for fun, I always encourage people to watch the movie office space. You ever seen that? No, I haven't. It's a, it's a silly comedy, but, um, part of the premise is that there's this guy who's kind of a loser. He's very much out of alignment with his heart's desires and, Uh, and, um, and he works in a cubicle, you know, he hates his life. And then he, he sort of accidentally gets hypnotized into, really what amounts to being in total alignment, totally authentic. And, um, and then it shows, you know, how everything changes when he decides to do what's true to him. And it's very funny, of course, because (laughs) he does all the, he does all these things that you think would make him get fired from his job and he ends up getting promoted, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, uh, it's not a a movie you want to watch with your kids because there's some (laughs) raunchy parts, but, but, uh, um, but it is, uh, I think it's a fun example of, because even though it was a silly comedy, there's a scene where he first has this shift. And I remember just, it's, it felt so like I could viscerally feel that difference, mm-hmm. even though, I mean, I guess it was just good acting, but, but um, um, that's, that's the difference. It's, you don't necessarily know other than by how you feel if you're really in that state of alignment with your authentic self. Uh, and and uh, I I was just the, our last Q and A episode uh, where we take listener questions. Um, we talked a lot about how um, when things are feeling off, just asking ourselves how how we feel about it, how our kids feel about it, because that energy and that alignment um, tells us so much, right? Tells us so much about mm. what's what's off in this moment. And how you can get that back. So that's really interesting. And I'll definitely put that movie on my list. <laughs> <laughs> you either love it or you hate it. It's like I said, it's kind of one or the but, other. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, anyway, T? <laughs> T. T is for trust. And of course, that's a very big deal in unschooling uh, and self directed education, where it, I mean, we've been taught very. Uh, ardently by our society that you can't trust children to learn and frankly that you can't trust them to behave and so um and that's the sort of the justification for all kinds of control um but um the problem with not trust is not only it it, not only does it um justify control but it it um it creates all kinds of anxiety when you're not in a state of trust you're always worried about what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's, I'm sure, a common experience with a lot of unschoolers, especially if you're new to it. It's kind of a leap of faith. You don't, and you have this anxiety, what if this doesn't work? And everybody you know, says that I ruined my child's life or what if my child grows up and hates me because I didn't make him go to school or blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> so there can be this anxiety <clears throat> that really sort of saps your power. So trust is a pathway to power through understanding. And uh, the reason I think understanding is so important is because when you understand, for example, the the true nature of, of the human 
species and how they're designed by nature to work, to, to learn, um, then you, it makes it possible to release those anxieties and move into a state of trust and, uh, and a state of ease and inner peace. And, um, that's particularly powerful, um, because kids, especially younger kids, they're such emotional beings that they feel like what you say is not as important as, as what they feel. Mm -hmm. And if, if you're in a state of anxiety and, and not really trusting and you're trying to be a good unschooler, but you're not really in that state of trust, um, the kids can feel that and that it has an effect on them and it can lead to all kinds of, uh, unenjoyable, um, effects. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, so it's really, uh, I think of trust as being kind of, um, a power, a particular power that more, more than just other kinds of power where it sort of amplifies things. This is more about taking away the things that unamplify, <laughs> I guess, uh, dampen. I can't think of the word for that, <laughs> that dampen, that, that dampen our power. So, so a lot of, uh, power gets sort of, um, drained from us when we are in this state of anxiety. And if we can find a way to move into trust, then it does really um, transform our experience and makes our kids just, uh, they tend to respond in a very positive way. And so it leads to um, easier times all in all. But uh, I'd like to, to think of trust in sort of three levels. So the first is trusting human nature, which is what we've been talking about and how the human species is evolved um, to be the animal that educates itself. And, uh, you can, I can, uh, point you to some resources, uh, to learn more about that, especially, uh, the stuff by Peter Gray. Mm -hmm. But, um, um, what was I saying? The second level of trust is, um, trusting yourself. Um, and in particular, what I call inner guidance. So this often has a lot to do with feelings and how we're sort of trained not to trust how we feel, not to trust our intuition, and instead to sort of go with authoritative exterior voices or, you know, what some sort of research thing says or whatever. And that's yeah. not necessarily a bad thing. <laughs> but, if, but if it's out of sync with what you feel in your gut, then you need to go a little yeah. deeper and, and ultimately um, – until you have that feeling in your gut that says, yes, now I understand it. And now I can relax and trust. Um, that's an important thing to do. Uh, and it doesn't happen unless you deliberately um, train or retrain yourself to trust your inner guidance. Mm -hmm. And the third, uh, the third aspect of trust is kind of more esoteric. And I just say it's about trusting life. And this is um, the kind of thing where um, you really have to expand your consciousness to sort of see a very big picture, very long term, like not even long term, like 10 years, but long term, like a thousand years <laughs> or, or 100,000 years um, and sort of trusting that that life has this wisdom that uh, that, you know, things work out and um, and, you know, we can't control everything. And I think uh, we live in an age where for many, many centuries we've been trying to see how much we can control life. And um, the school system is certainly one of those major areas where, <laughs> as a society, we've gotten really elaborate in our attempts to control the life process. Um, but I think that... Um, you know, real power comes from um, sort of surrendering control and um, it's kind of a Zen way to think of it. But, you know, really just to move into that space of saying, I trust life. And that can that can even be sort of confronting big, scary things like death, mm -hmm. you know, like, can you trust life enough to allow your child to take certain risks that could, you know, that could kill them. Anytime you let your child 
wander outside your front door and be more of a free range kid, um, you are taking that risk. And of course, if you, if you keep them overprotected, that actually, it's now understood that that actually makes children less safe because they don't learn how to manage their own safety. Mm -hmm. Um, so you need to, to, uh, move into trust to whatever degree it takes to, um, to, um, uh, to minimize, you know, helicopter parenting and that sort of thing. I mean, that one hits home because I just, I remember all that, my going through that process myself when my daughter, um, she just turned 18 and she wanted to, uh, go to New York city and live there on her own. Right. <laughs> so there was all these, you know, fears and everything that was coming up for me. And I had to get to the space where, you know, it, it was, um, reminding myself, uh, about the, the trust in our relationship, about, you know, who she is uh, and how important this was to her and how I could, you know, set up the environment as much as I could, like help her find a place to stay, et cetera, et cetera, and set up communication and all that stuff. But to get to a point to trust that this, and, and when I could look at things through her eyes from her perspective and see, uh, you know, why this was important to her, I truly understand that. Like you were talking about when you have that understanding, um, you can, you can really get to that level of trust. So that, that was when you're talking about, you know, cause that, those were, death was a fear, right? You know, mm-hmm. a, a young, a younger person living on their own in New York city, you know, and I'm where we're in Canada, you know, so it was, um, it, it got to that point. I had to take myself to that point where, you know, what if the worst happened? Right. Yeah. And I, I, I would say I, I go to that point on a regular basis. I mean, mm-hmm. even, uh, because we're not saying, you know, to trust life is just to be blindly faithful and just exactly. to, to never like to just to never think about safety or anything like that. Yeah. Um, so there are certain reasonable precautions that make sense. Um, but at the end of the day, things, can I say this shit happens, you know, and exactly. you can't control it all. Um, y- you just can't, uh, you know, something's going to happen that there's no way you possibly could have predicted it or, or, or prevented it, uh, other than, you know, living in a complete, you know, enclosed safety bubble of some kind, which is not really living. So, um, so yeah, every That's time, a, every time yeah. my kids go out, I like, there's just this little tiny part of me that's like, like I have to remember to trust life that, mm-hmm. you know, fate could take, <laughs> uh, my child away from me now. And I have to sort of accept that that's part of the bargain of being alive is mm-hmm. that, you know, we could all die at any point. Um, and w- once you, you know, you get good at making peace with death, it makes it pretty easy to trust just about anything. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then, and then it's just a matter of what are the reasonable precautions that, that, uh, allow us to find the right balance between safety and freedom and openness and spontaneity and all that. Mm-hmm. No, that's a great way to put it. So we have H. one more pathway. <laughs> the H is for heart, and uh, heart is a pathway to power through unconditional love. And um, I could have just called it unconditional love, but then it would have spelled patu. So, <laughs> um, but uh, unconditional love is kind of like I consider it. This particular pathway to power is is like magic more than any of the others because um, it's unconditional love is is everyone's power to create something from nothing. And, and you can, in other words, one of the ways that we get disempowered in this society is that we're trained to sort of uh, withhold love and only open to love when certain conditions are met. That's what conditional love is. So it's like, if you get good grades, I feel more love for you. You know, that's sort of a typical schooling attitude. You get more you get more evidence of my love for you when you behave correctly or when you jump through the right hoops. And um, 
the problem with that is that if if those particular hoops don't work for the child and aren't uh, and the child resists it, then your love is sort of held hostage. Your heart is held hostage. Um, and so uh, unconditional love is this superpower that we have where we can just um, decide for no reason at all to open our hearts and say, I love you, period. Right. Mm-hmm. And that's that's a pretty extraordinary thing. It sounds pretty simple or maybe a little pie in the sky, but I, my experience has been like it, when it feels the most magical is when I'm in the middle of an argument with one of my kids or with my wife. And, um, and then at some point there's this little voice in the back of my head that says, you know, you could just stop. <laughs> you <laughs> could just stop being so defended and just open your heart for no reason at all, even though this person hasn't given you an excuse to to open those doors, you can just open them because that's your power to do so. And when you do that for no reason at all, it's like you created something from nothing. Um, and I've had the experience of it being like almost like this sort of bizarre mystical, magical thing where it's like, what just happened? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Were we fighting? (laughs) It just sort of dissolves. It disappears. And, um, and I'm not saying that you don't need to work things out. Um, and that sometimes even arguing can be a healthy thing, but, um, but most of the time when we argue, it's because we're holding on to something, we're attached to something that is, we're really inappropriately, placing more value on being right than enjoying our connection with each other. And uh, so the superpower of unconditional love just says, you know what, I'm going to open my heart to you just because I can. I, I really love the way you've, uh, that's a great setup, the, the, that, <laughs> whole, uh, that whole system, that, that you went through your stuff and found those threads in them because – they, they align so well with all the threads that I found over the years um, coming at it from just from an unschooling perspective and the kind of parenting that supports that, right? Because it's all about uh, aligning with human nature, how we are as human beings, isn't it? Mm, so true. So true. Yeah. I love that. And yeah, then and- the other, <laughs> go ahead. I was just, I was just going to say, it's also simple. Like it, it mean, it seems like, wow, that's really powerful information, but really all it is, is just being real. (laughs) It's just like be, it's the way we were meant to be. And it's just, when you take away all of the different distortions, uh, what you get is this incredible, powerful, beautiful humanity. And, Mm -hmm. uh, um, that's what, again, is so wonderful about unschooling is it gives you the freedom to really go there to the best of your ability. And like you said, it is, you do find these almost magical times because, um, you know, when you manage to, um, use that trust, you know, whether it's, you know, releasing, um, our, our, our needs to be right or whatever in, in a, in an argument or in just, you know, your kid's doing something that that's making you uncomfortable yeah. and you'd really like them to change and do it your way or whatever. But when you take, when you manage to take, um, take yourself out of those moments and just trust and be open to it, you, it, it's just amazing, um, places that you could never have predicted. Like if you stretch your comfort zones, where things go and, and when you like, you were talking about how understanding leads to trust. If you can take kind of that leap of faith a few times and see where things go, you start to understand yeah. the the beauty and the magic of that simplicity of just kind of releasing. And it's pretty amazing, isn't it? It, it really is. I'm, I'm, uh, it, it feels like the greatest adventure to me. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, you know, every day, every time I, interact with someone who's sort of, especially other parents who are sort of having to deal with the school system and all the ways that it restricts their lives and all the ways that it undermines their, their children's happiness. And then by indirectly their, their whole family's happiness and ease of, of life, you know, 
uh, then I'm just like so grateful that we mm-hmm. chose this path. It's just so much easier. And there are definitely challenges, and we might want to talk about some of those. But, but, um, but overall, you, you have this uh, this power to to um, flow with life and allow all of the good gifts of life to to really come to the forefront. Mm-hmm. Well, I think our next questions are going to dive into some of those challenges. So how how about we move on? <laughs> sure. Uh, uh, it, we talk quite a bit in unschooling circles about uh, communicating openly with our children and, and how that facilitates that connection and trust in our relationships. Um, but some kids aren't big verbal communicators, you know, so when we're trying to have a conversation and they're just not talkers. And I really wanted to, to talk a bit about um it's not that they aren't giving us messages, giving us clues. It's just that not a lot of them are verbal. So I was hoping you could share uh, some of the other ways that we can communicate and connect with our children if we find ourselves in that situation. Sure. I'm a, I'm a really big fan of nonverbal communication. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and part of that is because um, it just a, a, as a sort of a – rebellion against this overbalance that we have in our society on things that are logical and word based. And there are a lot of different kinds of communication that are nonverbal and, and, and I wouldn't say it illogical, but non-logical that are, you know, more feeling based, more intuition based. Um, and, um, that tends to be minimized in our society. And so we tend to over rely on verbal communication and it kind of it taps into this issue of control that we've been talking about because um, one of the things that's that words are really good at is controlling. That's why we have lawyers and legal contracts that you know with all kinds of words that are designed to exact control over people. Um, and um, um, and you know that can be a good thing. I'm I'm definitely not opposed to words. I love words and overwriting and, and all that. But, but, um, uh, at, I think just because of the culture that we live in, we need to go out of our way to, um, to, to develop these other channels of communication. Um, uh, one of the daily groups I wrote was called the power of silence. And, um, what inspired that particular message was, um, that's something that just happened um, when my um, my wife got laryngitis when our kids were young, and so she decided not to talk for a couple of days uh, to rest her voice and let it heal. And and I was just observing that whole process, how it changed the dynamic and the subtleties of communication that were happening that had to take over. It's kind of like when a uh, when a person goes blind, their hearing gets better. You know, mm-hmm. and when a person and when you decide to talk less, um, your other forms of communication become more uh, developed and nuanced. So, um, so I I find this to be a, a particularly important concept when uh, when you're talking about very young children, because um, <clears throat> uh, I've seen a lot of parents who talk endlessly to their toddlers. Mm-hmm. And and if you never talk to them, of course, that would be, do them a disservice because because they need to learn the language by listening to you talk. But um, but if you talk to them or at them <laughs> too much, then um, <clears throat> I think it does tend to overwhelm them and they they begin to tune you out. Um, uh, particularly, I mean, there are some children who seem to be born with more um, verbal skills uh, or more. Uh, what do you call it? Uh, temperament for, for that sort of, um, ability. But, um, but I would say that most kids under about three, maybe two, um, are, um, a lot of, of the ways that we communicate with them verbally would be better done non-verbally. And that means through, um, touch, through, um, um, empathy, through just sort of intuiting, paying attention, watching the body language, um, um, being authentic with your own presence. And so that, so that your body language communicates to them. I mean, it's, it's, it's 
I think it's more important to like if if you, for example, if you just go into your heart and really um, and really just do whatever inner process would really open your heart to your child, and then you just sort of sit there or stand there and behold your child and and you're making eye contact. The child can feel that. They can feel the I love you in that. You don't have mm-hmm. to say I love you. And if and if you say I love you, but you don't have that that congruent body language, it starts to make the I love you meaningless. Does that make sense? It really so, does. Yeah. Yeah. So I so I really think we need to um challenge ourselves to to look for these other ways to communicate. Um, and it, you can turn it in, into a game like we sort of did when my wife had laryngitis, you know, it's like it was, it became a game to sort of figure out what we all needed to communicate, um, or what she needed to communicate without words. Um, and so it's, it's actually a game that I've encouraged some people to do. It's like, take a day, and tell your kids you're going to play a game where you pretend you can't talk and that you're going to communicate in other ways. Um, mm-hmm. And kids love that because then it's then they get to just have this really beautiful feeling-based communication with you where you can feel each other and you don't need to put it in words. It's kind of a, it's almost a romantic notion, isn't it? <laughs> it's like yeah. <laughs> what I love about our relationship is that you always know what I'm feeling and thinking. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but but I but I do I do think that it is I mean that's what intimacy is right. Mm-hmm. Well, and you you made such a great point before, and uh, you know I I've seen it so many times that they uh, our children can can feel what we're feeling like you know they can feel our body language you know when we're saying okay sure you can watch that show. Right. When our our whole body is like screaming, no, 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 you know, they can pick up on that. So and and they're, so they're not reacting um, from what we're saying. They are reacting from all the communicating we're doing, all that's in our body language. You know, they're like, oh, they're going to in in that particular example, you know, they could easily be thinking, oh, geez, I better stay here and watch as much as I can because, um, you know, they're. There, I can tell from their body language that they're soon going to explode and and tell me I can't go near the the TV or whatever again. <laughs> you know what I mean? They yeah. they can just pick up so much from that. So I think your idea of um of purposefully not talking for a bit just to see um how to to focus more on on how we're communicating with all the rest of it, it would be a really, really fun, fun challenge. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing is that sometimes when we talk, our, our brains sometimes are ahead of our hearts in a way. Mm-hmm. And so we know what to say before we know if it's the right thing to say. And if you pause yeah. before you talk and just sort of um, check in with your heart, um, a lot of the time your heart will say, you don't really need to say that. <laughs> it's like uh, that is so maybe what you're going to say is that. true but you don't need yep. to say it yeah and when you give um more space um it when you're not speaking it just gives space for things to uh, unfold more naturally right mm, yeah. you're you're exerting less control over the conversation and oh my gosh so many times I've discovered you know where my kids were going when you give them that openness and that space to make the next connection and the next connection you see where their mind was going and it was totally different than all the places my mind was going to take them if I you know jumped in and said x y and z let's do this let's do that you know I'm trying to support them and help them and I'm like oh getting all excited for them but really their mind was going in a totally different direction Mm. So cool. <laughs> yeah, and uh, another thing that comes to mind is that is that um, this nonverbal communication is something that has been observed by anthropologists in uh, in hunter gatherer cultures, where they mm. they rely much more on uh, what one anthropologist calls intuitive rapport uh, rather than talking things out. And mm-hmm. so uh, he gave a his name is Richard Sorensen, and there's this. 
a wonderful essay he wrote called Pre-Conquest Consciousness. Um, and uh, one of the stories he tells is of a group of teenage boys who are hunting together, and he observed them um, sort of acting like uh, – uh, obviously they couldn't talk because – they didn't want to scare away the, the, the monkey they were trying to shoot out of a tree. Um, uh-huh. and, um, but they, he saw them communicating nonverbally and how they could all feel each other. He described a situation where, you know, as one person was pulling back the bow, another person was pulling back a branch that was in the way of the path of the arrow, and someone else was moving into position to, to, uh, to catch the monkey when it fell or whatever. Um, I don't mm-hmm. remember all the details, but it, it described this really, uh, th- this really extraordinary kind of nonverbal communication. Um, and, uh, so it's in a way that's like dancing, you know, when you, it's the a body oriented communication is a very important part. If you're going to dance with someone, you need, you need to lead and follow and feel each other. Um, and then this, uh, another observation he made was that, like even with toddlers, uh, as the toddlers start to explore uh, farther and farther away from the caregiver, um, the toddler would just glance at the caregiver as, as he or she was moving in that direction. And if the caregiver was nervous about uh, where the toddler mm-hmm. was going, the toddler would just feel it. Like the mm-hmm. caregiver didn't have to say, don't go there, that's dangerous. You know, they didn't have to verbalize this sort of yeah. fear and, and amplify it. It was just uh, an intuitive feeling that was shared between two individuals. I do think um, that age makes a difference. And so, like I said, when you have really young kids, um, that's when I think it's most important to have lots of, uh, to, to develop this nonverbal channel. And then as they get older, I can certainly tell you in my family with older kids, we talk and work things out verbally all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and my wife and I are constantly processing stuff. <laughs> and that's, it's, it's, it's just maybe that's because of our culture. Like it's not necessarily a bad thing, but I think it can be very stressful on a very young child. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a great point. Uh, I guess we should probably move on to the next question. <laughs> uh, sure. You have a you have a great article on your website about holding presence with negative feelings such as frustration or fear, and I was hoping you could share what you mean by holding presence and how we can work to develop that skill. So <clears throat> you're referring to an article I wrote called "Ending the Blame Game," mm-hmm. uh, where it's where I first mentioned that term. I sort of just made it up. Um, this idea of holding presence because it's just how I described what I was doing when I was able to transcend that game. And Mm -hmm. um, of course, um, blame is sort of a a catch-all word for a lot of different kinds of of, um, uh, uninspiring, unpleasant interactions between people. I would say that blame is a kind of a a catch all for um, a lot of different things that are unpleasant, like uh, judgment and accusation and um, um, righteous, you know, um, one upmanship, that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> but it all sort of um, boils down to it's, it's something that we do, then it, it begins innocently enough as just you've something in you feels off. You feel like there's something wrong. You can't quite necessarily, you don't necessarily immediately put your finger on it. But what we tend to do, what we've been trained to do is that you immediately look for something to blame for that feeling. It's like, in other words, um, uh, it, you know, if I, I could get mad at the weather, I could get mad at the traffic. The traffic is making me feel this way. Um, and you, and you blame, but it's basically, you have this feeling in you that something is wrong and that kind of turns into something is wrong with me and I need to get rid of it. Do you know what I mean? (laughs) It's like, I don't want to be 
the the cause of this bad thing. So I need to assign the badness somewhere else. And that's basically what we're doing when we're blaming. Um, so um, holding presence is um, is an alternative to that particular dynamic because when you assign blame to someone else or something else, two bad things happen. One is that you sort of destroy that relationship or undermine it. And, and the other thing that happens is you basically give your power away because now that other person is making you feel bad rather than mm -hmm. you staying connected to your own power to, to create positive feelings in yourself. So if you are willing to hold presence with that feeling that something is wrong, instead of uh, passing it on to someone else, then you get this, um, um, you open to this process uh, of um, transformation. In other words, um, the, the feeling of wrongness is actually there to teach you something. And if you can stay with it, um, often it'll, te it'll teach you something like, oh, I'm, I'm holding a false belief. You know, or I'm, I'm uh, mm -hmm. worrying about something that isn't even real. It's just an illusion or it's just a fear based on something I learned from the media or whatever. Um, so if you can stay with it, um, then you get those insights. Um, and that either will tend to make the negative feeling go away or just sort of dissolve um, or it will transform into something more empowering like um, determination. If you feel anger, often that will transform into determination and you use that energy to do something positive. Um, so that's what I mean by holding presence. And um, um, the example that I use in the article is um, that you can practice holding presence by doing something intentionally, just as a kind of a game, doing something intentionally that you normally would try to avoid, that you would normally think of as bad. And the example that I use is um, getting in the shower deliberately with the water too cold. <laughs> because uh, most people who are sensitive to, to that sort of thing will, you know, if they step in the shower and they weren't expecting it to be cold and it's cold, it's like this very almost angry feeling about it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the water shouldn't be cold. This is a shower. The water is supposed to be warm. You know. Stomp, stomp. <laughs> <laughs> and um, who used up all the water? You know, it's like that. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, so, but if you do it deliberately, and you step into that slightly too cold shower, and you notice your body saying it shouldn't be this way, and at the same time you're just practicing. Well, it is this way. I just am approaching it with acceptance. I'm just willing to make peace with reality, with what is. And, and when you do that, that's basically holding presence. And it will teach you something. For example, uh, it might teach you that, oh, I can handle cold water. It's not that big of a deal. Or um, I actually find, can see where this might be pleasurable to occasionally experience a new variety of temperature. You know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. So it's just a silly exercise. Um, but we take these things for granted uh, and they pile on. There's so many things that we think things should be this way. And then when they aren't, we, we look for someone to blame. And I that's that, no fun. <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. There were so many good things in that. But um, I, that is such a cool example just to to feel what it's like to to stay with it. Right. Mm -hmm. Rather than then, like you said, assign the blame, shift the blame, because because when we do that, you know, at first we're like um, trying to, uh, I don't know, make ourselves feel better. Right. Shift shift that blame somewhere else. But you're you're actually uh, giving away power that way, aren't you? Because because then all of a sudden that thing 
has the power over you to make you angry and frustrated. So, you know, maybe it's the the hot water tank, right? Right. <laughs> the size <laughs> of the hot water tank. But, you know, in 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 anything, you're you're giving them that power so that moving forward, you don't feel in control. You feel like all these things in your life, you know, the traffic, the weather, the hot water tank, the the everything have so much control over your life and you you'll have uh, lost that whether Whereas when you can stay with it, I think there's so much more self-awareness that you can find in there and you realize you have so much more power and control. That's what you're talking about, it feeling so much more empowering, right? Because you realize that it's all within, your days are all within your control. Those are just things that happen, not things that have, like when you you blame it, all of a sudden you've given it power over you. That's so interesting. Yeah. And you sort of pointed out a paradox here by saying your days are within your control because we're talking about letting go of control. And mm-hmm. and and in doing so, there's a sort of a, a, a higher level of control. In other words, yeah. uh, it's one thing to try to control life, to control the weather, to control nature, to control your children. It's another thing entirely to acknowledge that you do have the power to control your inner world. It, to the extent yeah. that you can decide what perspective you're going to take and notice that when I take this perspective, I feel shitty. And when I take that other perspective, I feel more powerful and peaceful. Mm-hmm. And so it's my choice. I'm free to choose that perspective. And, um, and that's very powerful. And in a way it is a kind of control, but not in the, in the domineering way. Traditional that normally, sin. You know, yeah. 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 Yeah, it's like when you realize you don't need to control all these things around you, uh, you you just you feel so much more centered and, <laughs> yeah, for lack of a better term, in control of of yourself, right? It, yeah, yeah. It, it is quite the paradox, but it's uh, it it's really it, it it does feel so empowering. Maybe power is the best word. Release control, feel <laughs> power. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I, I talk about a distinction between pseudo power and authentic power. So uh, pseudo power yeah. is is what you get in normal types of control strategies yeah. that we use, and it's not really powerful because it's always just fleeting, and you end mm-hmm. up having to defend it. Um, so it drains you even more. But yep. uh, uh, but authentic power is just it's sort of tapping into these aspects of life that are already naturally and infinitely powerful, especially love is this infinite power that there's, it's why we have this magical power to, to create it from nothing because there's an unlimited supply. It's just, all you have to do is decide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's brilliant. Um, Let's talk a little bit more uh, about how easy it is to slip into control. (laughs) as our children get older, we, we touched on this a little bit before, uh, we can sometimes find ourselves feeling uncomfortable with some of their choices, you know, mm. the things that, that they're pursuing and, and that feel really uh, good to them. And when we start feeling that, that fearfulness, we start to feel protective of them. And that's when we can so easily slip into control because that is what, what we live with, right? That's the go-to response of our, our culture. You, yeah. you know, your parents' job is to say, no, sorry, you know, you can't do that. And then impose some consequences. Say, if I find that you're doing X, you know, you're going to lose this privilege or whatever if they dissipate, disobey. So um, I just thought we could talk a bit about how that um can damage your relationship, that trust, that connection, and what we might do instead when we're um, starting to feel overly like protective and fearful. Hmm. Wow, that's that's really big. I, I I mean, I think the word consequences is is um, is a, a, the, ripe for deconstruction, and yeah. um, it, it is one of the most disingenuous words in the whole parenting lexicon, <laughs> you know, because people talk about consequences when they're really talking about a punishment. It's just a way to control yeah. people. And I always say the only authentic consequence is love, right? <laughs> it's like, mm-hmm. whatever yeah. you do, I love you, period. <laughs> That's yeah, consequence. Yeah. And what that means <laughs> is that 
you know, uh, if you behave in a way that I don't like, then that means uh, we need to tend to the partnership. This is why I, I think partnership is one of the most central uh, concepts that I talk about in being mm-hmm. with children. And unschooling really is a kind of partnership education. You're partnering with the child and with their nature. Um, but, uh, but in a behavior situation, um, rather than, uh, I mean, sort of the old view is that uh, the child is supposed to behave a certain way and I, and I'm, I have the, the right to control that. Um, mm-hmm. And if you're in a partnership orientation, say, well, we each have equal dignity. Obviously, I'm, I'm, uh, we're not equal in every way. I'm older, more experienced, and, 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 and I have more legal rights, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, but, the, um, but as, as human beings, we're equal, and I have no more right to uh, control my child than my child has a right to control me. Um, but that's – we're not particularly interested in controlling each other. We're interested in having an enjoyable partnership. Um, and that does mean that we are interacting <laughs> and we're, we're, you know, we're, we are, um, it's not so much controlling each other as, is doing a dance together. Right. Mm-hmm. And that means yeah. we need to be attuned with each other. We need to understand each other's needs and, um, and we need to be most first and foremost, I think we need to just sort of be committed to being creative because it's inevitable that there are going to be situations where what I want and what my child wants are are not the same thing. And then it looks like a win lose situation. And when it looks like that, we have the power to choose a different a, a, a different perspective that it doesn't have to be win-lose. It can be win-win. <clears throat> and I like to say it's a win-win-win because I win, you win, and the partnership wins. The partnership gets yeah. stronger. Um, so, uh, but that, in order to create those win-win outcomes, um, you really have to be committed to a creative process. That Every time we seem to be at odds, it's an opportunity to be co-creators and to step into... Uh, a collaborative uh, uh, um, process, I guess. Um, and that's, um, you know, it, if we can avoid the, the, the reactivity and the tendency to move into blame and just sort of hold presence long enough to calm ourselves down, <laughs> then we can actually move into that creative process and, uh, and really enjoy it and say, well, okay, wait a minute. Sorry I overreacted. What I really want to understand is what are you needing here? And, and I want you to understand what I'm needing here. And let's, let's just um, assume that in this universe of infinite possibilities, there is, some, there is at least one possibility where both of us meet our needs or, or mm-hmm. both of us satisfy our desires. And, um, and those creative possibilities that you discover in that process – can often be, you know, better than what you wanted in the first place. And, and maybe it's not, maybe it's just different, or maybe it's mm-hmm. even a little bit inferior <laughs> in terms of like what would have been perfectly ideal for you. But on the bigger picture, it's, it's a better outcome because you have this stronger partnership and partnership. yeah. And, yeah. and that pays off mm-hmm. big time in the long term. Um, I like to say that, you know, if, if your kids are still young and you commit yourself to cultivating a partnership culture in your family, um, then you have you know, plenty of years to do it. And by the time they're teenagers, you don't have any of the problems or very little of the problems that are typical of teenagers if you've, if you've mm-hmm. taken, made that effort. And, uh, and I'm, not, I'm not saying that we've had no problems. But definitely mm-hmm. not some of the horror stories that I hear or some of the just the sad situations that I see where uh, uh, young adults and their parents don't like each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, I think so much of what we've um, been talking about this whole time leads up to this, right? Because it's that that when you're feeling the urge to control, I think that's a a great point to try and 
um, see that as a clue that it's time to refocus back on on partnership, right? Um, and that reminds you, okay, I should see. It reminds you to to look at the situation from their perspective, from their eyes, and not not even from um, like what I would do in their situation because I'm not them. Right. It's it's to see the whole situation um, from inside them, right. From their perspective, why this is important to them. Because once you have that understanding of where they're coming from, at least you can bring that like to your whole co-creation conversation. That's how you guys can, how we can find a path forward, um, as partners where we're all, reasonably satisfied. Like you said, it may not be like the perfect, but when we can find something where we're all like, yeah, okay, I can live with that. I can do that. That works. You know, I love that third win because that's when the partnership has becomes more solid, becomes again, another layer of connected and trusting because you have again, found a way, a way through this. So yeah, I think that's a a beautiful way to, uh, to think about it as a, a win-win-win. Totally. And and I would even go a step further for those who are adventurous mm -hmm. in the realms of consciousness <laughs> <laughs> that you can actually, I mean, what you said, I think is true to say, well, I'm, you know, what would I do or what would I want? And, and, and then to remember, well, but I'm not her, or I'm not him. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But on a deeper level, you can actually say, I am her, like, in this sort of more esoteric, new agey, we're all one kind of thing. Yeah. And uh -huh. and if you cultivate that consciousness of oneness, that and it's a sort of a paradox, we're separate and we're connected, right? Um, mm -hmm. But uh, we tend to focus in our culture more on the separateness and not that much on the connectedness. So you can actually play thought games and, um, and decide, uh, okay, for the next 20 minutes, I'm going to be... Like I'm going to fully inhabit with wholeheartedly inhabit the perspective of my child. <clears throat> and, you know, if they love something that I think is meh, you know, I'm going to love it. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and just yep. feel yeah. that. Um, and um, and that opens you up to discovering uh, deeper kinds of connection, but also even just things where, you know what, I my opinion about that one thing wasn't wasn't uh, fully informed. <laughs> now that I've <laughs> totally stepped into my child word world, I, uh, uh, I have a, a greater appreciation for that. Oh, so, so many times when I've done that, like when we've been, I felt uncomfortable and then it's like, okay, so where, where is this? And, and putting myself, um, you know, you can think about it, think of it that way as, as, as being one, but putting myself in their spot so many times I was able to stretch my comfort zone is kind of how I have talked about it before, mm -hmm. because all of a sudden it's like, wow, you know, those pieces, um, that I was bringing, um, into my thoughts or, you know, maybe they were some stereotypes that I picked up or some negative experience that I had. Um, those were, um, clouding my vision and my perspective grew just by taking the time to see it, how they see it. And, 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 and often regularly enough anyway, the, the whole kind of problem dissolved because I realized it was just me stretching a little bit to really see them. Right. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's very cool. <laughs> okay. Last question. Uh, you are also a founding member of the Alliance for Self-Directed Self Education, which advocates for both unschooling and alternative schools that support self-directed education and I love that the like when I first went there when last year when your website was up I loved uh the phrase uh normalize self-directed education as a whole I thought that was such a an amazing purpose just to um get it out there for people to to know that this exists and that it is a viable option so I was uh wondering if you'd like to give us an update on the work that the alliance is doing now uh, sure. So, yeah, I mean, definitely our, our, our goal is uh, it started out as a group called the Tipping Points Group, and it was just a bunch of people that uh, really, really wanted to see 
our culture, our society reach a tipping point where there's a shift uh, into the idea that that um, self-directed education is just as valid, if not more valid or more effective um, in comparison to traditional schooling and that it's just sort of a known thing. Like, wouldn't Mm -hmm. it be cool if everyone grew up knowing that um, that that's a, that's a choice. We don't have to send our kids to school or to a conventional school. We can send them to one that really honors their nature, or we can homeschool them in a, in a, a way that honors their natural, um, educative instincts. Um, mm-hmm. and, um, so a lot of what we're doing really is, um, advocacy and, and public relations and trying to build bridges um, uh, not only um, between us and the, and the mainstream, but also uh, between the different sort of, um, uh, f- we sometimes call it the flavors, the different flavors of self-directed <laughs> education, so, which includes the free schools and, and uh, unschooling and there's different flavors of unschooling and, you know, and sometimes we focus too much on these differences. We really want to focus on what we all have in common, which is that we want Mm -hmm. a world where children are free to learn naturally and free to learn um, without the sort of um, impediments that are, uh, that come along with uh, standard imposed schooling. So that's, uh, that's, uh, you know, our main mission and we've been, uh, building a structure to support that uh, a, a bit at a time because it's just sort of a, you know, mostly volunteer in a mm-hmm. shoestring budget. So, <laughs> so far, unless somebody yeah. out, if, if somebody out there wants to donate a very large sum, I'd like to talk to you. <laughs> um, You'd because be welcome. <laughs> the more, the more uh, we are um, uh, interested in, in fundraising to, to create some really, um, more impactful initiatives that reach more people and get the word out even more effectively. Um, so where are we? Hmm. Um, I guess uh, before, uh, before I say that, I wanted to say that, um, that I, I, so a lot of unschoolers, including myself, uh, have been allergic to the word education and um, and I think that that has a lot to do with um, because when most people think of education, they just think of schooling or the school system. And yeah. um, and uh, in the initial um, uh, form- formative uh, period of this group, we were going to re- use the term self-directed learning, which is a fairly uh, common uh, term used among yeah. uh, some unschoolers. And and uh, free schoolers, so, um, and and then uh, Peter Gray, who's one of the uh, main founding members, uh, he came one day and said, um, I think we should use the word education instead of learning. And he and uh, he's sort of a professor of psychology, and he uh, he he understands some of the nuances of the terminology in a way that is different from the the conventional. Um, uh, assumptions that people have about that word, and so we actually had this really long debate. I was I was sort of the opposition because I, coming from the unschooler perspective, I really just that that word made me cringe, you know, um, mm-hmm. and it just sort of had so much baggage on it. And um, uh, eventually, uh, Peter made a really strong case for uh, um, why. Uh, that that word education is better if we understand it in a different way. That education is not the same thing as schooling, um, mm-hmm. but education is really um, a whole life process of acquiring knowledge and values and skills that are conducive to a satisfying and meaningful life. And that's there's the word school is not in that definition. <laughs> um, yeah. So um, uh, and. Uh, that's, I'd say that that's congruent with another term that some people like, which is life learning. Um, Mm -hmm. but, um, uh, but this idea of education is something that, um, 
from an anthropological or psychological perspective, it is something that is required of a human being because we're a cultural animal and education is this process by which we acquire our culture and our ability uh, to use all the tools of the culture, including language and knowledge and other in technology and such. Um, so I was eventually convinced that, okay, fine, let's use education. Let's, let's use the word education, but let's make it a part of our mission to redefine education so that, that mm -hmm. when we talk about it, we make it clear that we're not talking about schooling and all the trappings of schooling. We're talking about, uh, about this, this natural life process of following your curiosity and being playful and acquiring knowledge through exploration and, and all that. And yes, that can include some formal schooling as many unschoolers do choose for themselves. Um, but it's not imposed. It's never imposed. It's always uh, something that comes from personal freedom um, with the support of parents and community. So, um, so that's what we mean when we talk about self-directed education. And, um, and we didn't even really have the debate about the word self-directed because <laughs> I know that's a debate sometimes in, in like with the word child led, um, yeah. people don't like <laughs> that term and it sounds a little similar, but really what we mean by self-directed is that, um, it's, it's sort of in contrast to teacher directed or school system directed, um, mm -hmm. that, um, the, the ultimate arbiter of the path is the person who is educating himself or herself. And, um, and that means that we're not going to impose anything on them. We, we may very well influence them uh, and, and um, offer um, enriching experiences and, and um, strew things and all that other kind of stuff that we do, but, um, but never to the point of putting pressure or, or um, denying them the right to say no. Or, or no thank you, or maybe later. <laughs> um, yeah. So um, it's, really, it's really about honoring the, the, the child's uh, right to, to be the, the, the final arbiter of, of their um, educative process, which um, when they're really young, of course, it's, it's almost like, you know, like a two or three year old, you, you kind of function very much in sync with each other. It's not, mm -hmm. not, I'm not, we're not suggesting that a self-directed education means that, you know, a two year old is going to decide whether or not, you know, the family has a vacation <laughs> or whatever, but, <laughs> um, <clears throat> but you do, um, um, it's, it's about that maintaining that partnership. And, and one mm -hmm. of the principles of partnership is that, um, you work with each other, not, uh, dominate each other. So, mm -hmm. um, just wanted to, to say that in case people were wondering, you know, uh, why do we call it self-directed education? That's why it's the best that we could come up with for something that will, um, help build this bridge so that, you know, um, we're, we're not, we don't want to, um, we don't want to, um, take away anything from the beauty and the fun of the word unschooling, but we also, um, want to have terminology that, um, people who are kind of still have one foot or maybe both feet in that control oriented culture, um, can wrap their brains around. What is this? It is education mm. and it is different because it's not directed by teachers and, and, uh, educators. It's directed by the child. Oh yeah. Oh, I'd love, I loved hearing a little bit about the history. That's really interesting. And, and I can definitely see how that, um, it, that, that term does self-directed education does seem like an, uh, a bridge term, right? That's not, um, going to get that initial, negative reaction, but it's going to be, you know, that, that unschooling, I mean, you know, go read the comments on any unschooling article, right? right. It's, it's just, you know, that, um, initial burst of, of whatever, 
<laughs> but but yes, that's a bridge work because education is a word kind of that they know, right? And self-directed is what's going to raise the question like, well, what what does that mean? So mm -hmm. I think it it it, it does really help um uh, facilitate a, uh, some more connection and conversation. And like you said, I love how you explain that. It, it always goes back to that partnership, right? Yeah. 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 And, and my hope, this isn't necessarily part of the Alliance, but, but my hope is that, um, that we will evolve this culture to the point where we don't even call it self-directed education. We might, we might, mm -hmm. uh, if you're an academic, you might refer to it as education <laughs> and, uh, yeah. but, even better would, you know, just everyday person wouldn't even think of it as a thing. It's just, it's just living. And, um, mm -hmm. and, um, if you're living, you're, you're learning and growing and, and, um, um, developing your potential. That's just a part of life. And to have that sort of, uh, like where education is like, it is to a person like water is to a fish, you know, <laughs> that, mm -hmm. that, so yeah, that yeah. It, if you're a fish, water isn't a thing. It's just, like, it's just what, it, what's everywhere. Mm -hmm. Right. And so often, you know, uh, you, you know, go back and look at my blog post because ultimately every time uh, I'll go through and, uh, you know, explaining some concept or whatever at the end, it's always unschooling is life. It's just living, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's wonderful. Yeah. I can that that's a beautiful dream too, you know. <laughs> right. And it's it's fun to even, imagine what's possible with yeah. a society that really um gets the power of self directed education and um and that we could design our the structures of society to support that mm -hmm. instead of these con control structures where um we can imagine um, all kinds of, um, you know, the resources that are currently put into um, control-based schooling could be put into things like uh, libraries uh, that are, you know, that are that go beyond just books and 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 other media, but that are mm -hmm. places where people gather to explore all kinds of things, um, and uh, you know, more like community centers that have. Uh, uh, all sorts of enrichment opportunities and, and a place where people gather so that we have social opportunities as well. Exactly. So it's not, it's not like an age based thing, right? Where kids go somewhere to learn. It's, it's having places in society, like you said, community structures where everyone, um, can go learn, be, you know, um, be in relationship with each other mm -hmm. you know what i mean yeah does that make sense yeah, yeah. No. that takes away the 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 control aspect and um the controlling others aspect and the whole age thing where you know kids have to learn and adults get to live everybody's living and learning together beautifully said now now you're talking about my utopia <laughs> mine too that's beautiful <laughs> well I must say, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today, Scott. We went a little bit long, but I had so much fun chatting with you. <laughs> uh, me too. This has been really fun. Oh, that's awesome. And before we go, where's the best place for people to connect with you online? Uh, well, dailygroove.com is uh, the best place to find my work, and I have links there to some of my other work. So I do offer... Um, coaching sessions for uh, parents who want support to sort of make that shift. Sometimes it's really hard and you have to dig a little deeper to, to, to shift out of the old control paradigm into the partnership system. So um, that's mm -hmm. certainly something that, um, that I'd like to help people do. And you can find information about that on that website and some others that are linked from it. And then uh, of course I invite people to subscribe to the daily groove and um, and you get a few times a week, you get, um, these short reminders that you can use to, um, um, to just boost your consciousness a little bit every day and, and practice, uh, living in this, uh, new paradigm. And I think that's, that's awesome. of course, um, the Alliance is a, a lot of my effort is going into that right now and helping, uh, them, you know, we're creating, um, more resources on the website and that, Website is self directed 
org with a hyphen between self and directed. So um, that's something that you can uh, become a member of and get uh, sort of involved in um, in the movement. We're we're going to be building a lot of uh, a lot of uh, we're going to be working with people who are allies in the movement and um, and you know there's always someone who's just doing it, but then there's then the, there's someone who is like they want to make it like they want to advance the movement for everyone. Mm -hmm. And, and I would consider mm -hmm. you to be one of those people. Um, and so we'll be inviting people like you to participate in, um, in being in combining our, uh, efforts and our creativity toward advancing this movement and making, uh, self-directed education, uh, an, a normal and legitimate path. Or, that well, we already wonderful. know it's a normal and legitimate path. I mean, <laughs> yeah. to everyone else. Let other people know. <laughs> oh, that's awesome, Scott. And I will definitely put links to all that stuff in the show notes. That's terrific. And thank you so much again. Have a wonderful day. I will. Thank you so much. And uh, I'm, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to connect with you and your listeners. Thanks for listening. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes at livingjoyfully.ca forward slash podcast. While you're there, be sure to pick up your free copy of my book, What is Unschooling? In it, we'll explore some of the common questions people have when they first hear about unschooling, like how will my child learn? How do I know they're learning? What is de-schooling? And how do I get started? It's also available at many online ebook retailers. And if you'd like to connect online, you can find me on Facebook at Living Joyfully. Until next time, have fun living and learning with your family.